In January 1973, after more than 10 years of fighting, some 13,000 prisoners of war captured by United States forces in rice paddies and jungles, in villages and cities, were in South Vietnamese PW camps. Together with more than 24,000 PW captured by the Republic of Vietnam and its other allies. Question. Were PW treated in accordance with international law? Regardless of the reasons for U.S. involvement in Vietnam, once we found ourselves there, it was our duty to conform to all laws regulating warfare, and our policies were prepared in conformity with those laws. From the first moment an individual was captured, every effort was made to comply with the principle, spirit, and intent of the Geneva Conventions, which require humane and fair treatment of all persons taken into custody during an armed conflict. The North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong maintained that they were under no obligation to respect the Geneva Conventions. United States and South Vietnamese forces, on the other hand, sought to comply with international law. As soon as practicable, detainees were identified, tagged, and moved to a brigade collecting point for screening. Persons who were obviously innocent civilians were released, usually to be returned directly to their homes. Further screening took place at division collecting points, the largest detainee holding facilities operated by U.S. forces. All persons captured or detained, whether in uniform or not, were afforded the protection of the Geneva Conventions. There were isolated instances of mistreatment, but these were the exception, not the rule, and not the policy. Rather, commanders emphasized the need for proper treatment and protection of detainees. As soon as practicable, PW were evacuated to PW camps operated by the military police of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam with technical advice and support provided by military police advisors of the United States Army. As the war went on, growing in size and scope, so the need for more accurate accountability increased. Accurate accounting procedures were needed to keep us advised of the number of enemy captured and resulting logistical needs. By the end of the war, accountability procedures were in effect using computers, both in Saigon and in Washington. There was an accurate record for every individual reported captured by U.S. forces consistent with international law. To monitor compliance with the Geneva Conventions, delegates of the International Committee of the Red Cross were stationed in the Republic of Vietnam. They made approximately 500 visits to detainee facilities throughout South Vietnam to be certain that adequate food, clothing, shelter, and medical care were being provided, and all detainees properly treated. Most of the enemy PW were held at the central PW camp on the island of Phu Qua. The remainder was interned at five other PW camps on the mainland. Humane treatment of PW captured by U.S. forces, even after they were turned over to the South Vietnamese for internment. Such international transfers of PW are envisaged in Article 12 of the Geneva Convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war. U.S. military police advisors at all PW camps provided technical assistance to Arvin commanders and continued assurance that the requirements of the Geneva Conventions Here at the mainland camp of Benoit, 
most of the sick, the wounded, and youth were gathered together. The PW population was composed of regular soldiers of the Vocational and educational programs were made available to the PW. Generally, PW fell into one of three groups. New Life PW were former Viet Cong who made clear their desire to remain with the Republic of Vietnam after the war. The New Life PW were segregated from the others who remained committed to North Vietnam. The majority of the Communist PW did not pose substantial problems. There were some PW, however, who required segregation in order to maintain discipline and security, and these were referred to as hardcore. These PW were sullen and bellicose, refusing to cooperate with any of the self-help programs provided for the New Life and other Communist PW. PW spent much of their time working to improve their own lot. Under the Geneva Conventions, PW are not permitted to do any work which would assist the captors' war effort. Vocational training facilities were used for the manufacture of artificial legs. Work done by PW was for the construction and maintenance of their own camps and for their own health, comfort, and welfare.
as provided in the Geneva Conventions, PW were able to send and receive mail and to receive parcels from their loved ones. Traditional Vietnamese holidays were celebrated. There were Buddhist and Christian religious services. The Paris Agreement of 27 January 1973 required that all PW be released within 60 days. A four-party joint military commission was established. Its members arranged release schedules, selected the locations of release sites, and worked out the technicalities of repatriation. The repatriation of communist PW began on the 12th of February. United States Air Force C-130s provided most of the necessary transportation. On the eve of the signing of the Paris Agreement, nearly 11,000 former Viet Cong soldiers elected not to return to North Vietnam or the Viet Cong. These New Life PW were released into South Vietnamese society. Careful accountability was maintained for the PW awaiting release. A complete personnel record, including medical data, accompanied each PW. Many of the PW had been emaciated when captured. However, a nutrition survey team from the United States Army Medical Research and Nutrition Laboratories found that PW gained from 8 to 15 pounds per man while in South Vietnamese PW camps. As the release operation began, not everything went according to schedule. At Benoit, where movement to the airport was scheduled to begin at 6 a.m., PW refused to move until it received instructions from the Viet Cong. The Subcommittee on Captured Persons of the Joint Military Commission was dispatched from Saigon to confer with the reluctant PW. This delay held up the release of 27 American prisoners of war at Lok Ninh. 
After a lengthy meeting, the PW agreed to start the repatriation. In accordance with the Paris protocols, the sick and the wounded were moved first. As is customary in Vietnam, the PW used towels to shade their heads from the sun. Accountability was strictly maintained both in the camps and at the release sites. Special provision was made for the transportation of litter cases. Other difficulties were encountered during the release of the women. Throughout the conflict, women soldiers were captured alongside other enemy soldiers. The female PW were interned at Quy Nan. Following the North Vietnamese invasion during Easter 1972, the women were evacuated and cared for at Can Tho. As a group, they remain difficult and contentious, discarding clothing, daily rations of rice, and other personal items, and staging fainting spells at release sites. Priorities of release were carefully followed. First the sick and wounded, then the aged and the women. Finally, the able-bodied PW. Loading of aircraft was assisted by U.S. Air Force personnel and Army advisors. 
observed this action. By terms of the Paris Agreements, the International Commission of Control and Supervision was created, composed of representatives from Canada, Hungary, Indonesia, and Poland. The ICCS observed every phase of the release of PW. Air transport was chosen both because of the speed of movement and the lack of suitable ground or water transportation. Many PW were flown to Quang Tri City just north of Wei and close to Tak Han River. They were then moved by truck through Quang Tri City, a bitter reminder of the war. Upon arriving at the exchange site, some of the PW made a final gesture of defiance, discarding their PW camp issued uniforms. The North Vietnamese made a show of providing assistance, sometimes including medical personnel, whether PW needed it or not. American and South Vietnamese representatives to the JMC were on hand throughout release operations. Exchange site rosters contained the names of each PW, his internment serial number, date of capture, date of birth, and parents' names. As each man was checked off, he was moved to a new tent to receive a fresh uniform. ICCS members observed all formalities at the repatriation sites.
As each new group of PW reached an exchange site, the same rituals of defiance were repeated. This was at Loch Ninh. Most PW who did not wish to accept return to the communist side had already been released under the new life program. However, some PW changed their minds at the last minute. One such was this man. While the ICCS discussed what should be done, a group of newly released PW moved into the area. As it turned out in this instance, a decision on the matter would be violently settled. South Vietnamese military police attempted to protect the man from harassment or intimidation. A decision was made to take him back to the aircraft, but VC personnel prevented such a move. While the ICCS was still discussing the matter, a group of approximately 25 men rushed the guards and took the man by force. They dragged him off behind the release site and away from the cameras, beating and kicking him. VC officials at the site did nothing. Finally, when someone in the crowd raised an arm, the attack stopped. Later, at the insistence of the ICCS, the man was brought to their shelter for questioning. A clearly frightened PW now insisted he would return to the VC. The South Vietnamese asked if the man was giving his answers under mental duress as a result of the beating. The ICCS decided that if the man was beaten and still wanted to stay, that was up to him. Uh, I saw him grabbed by the other prisoners and dragged on the ground. And when he answered questions here, his mouth was beating. When I first saw him, the time back, his mouth was not beating. Yeah. The next time such an incident occurred, the ICCS was ready. When a second PW refused repatriation, the ICCS chairman took steps to isolate the man and prevent any intimidation. He was escorted directly to an ICCS shelter. When the ICCS prepared to ask the man whether he wished to remain with the VC or return to an area controlled by the Republic of Vietnam, the VC attacked what they termed the Saigon regime claiming the man had been intimidated. The VC then marched approximately 50 of the returnees up to the meeting site, apparently hoping to frighten the man with a show of force. The U.S. and South Vietnamese protested the show as being barbaric. 
The only thing we should do is the same as we did the last time. We do the same on the last man we ask him. Does he want to stay or does he want to go? It was finally agreed to allow the man to return to territory controlled by the Republic of Vietnam. On the last day scheduled for repatriation, a group of more than 200 PW at Benoit refused to return to the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong. The North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong refused to witness the event. We would like to speak to some of the PW were notified that they would not be forcefully repatriated, but would be released in South Vietnam instead. Their reaction spoke for itself. The United States, the Republic of Vietnam and her other allies in the recent conflict share with more than 130 nations a special commitment to the civilized standards in the Geneva Conventions. The human rights of the captured were protected. Their wounds or illnesses were treated. The PW were interned in accordance with international law. Delegates of the International Committee of the Red Cross had access to the PW and recommendations to PW camp authorities were carried out. More than 26,000 enemy PW were returned to the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese, while 11,000 new life PW were released and returned to take up the traditional Vietnamese way of life in South Vietnamese society. <laughs> 